Hey, Cameron, how are you? Hey, how you doing, Annie? I'm doing good. good. Yeah, I am just having some problems with my computer. Um, but I so I dialed in from my phone, but I'm just going to reboot my computer and I'll I'll be back online shortly. So awesome. Good to see you again. Hi, I guess you've been extremely, extremely busy, eh? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no comment, yeah. no comment. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I know what it's like. Yeah, it's all smiles it's... right now, but then uh, it's, <laughs> it's yeah, lots, lots of work. So, but yeah. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's good to have you, honey. Yeah, thank you. Hey, Kent, how you doing? Oh, Kent is busy. Kent's being silent. He's being muted. I, I'm. I was self muted. <laughs> All right. Yeah, my computer just uh, decided to um, not load the Zoom, so I'm just uh, clearing it. I haven't rebooted it in a while, so it's it's Microsoft Windows, you know. Have to do oh, that yeah. every now and then. But my my uh, Exos Two is working great. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> I don't have to. Re uh, you don't have to reboot that very often. No, it's 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 really nice. I, I can't wait. To, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Jerry's had his PMC eight system running like all year. You know. Wow. He just leaves it on. That was a great session yesterday. I, I um, I'm sorry I couldn't join live, but um, but uh, yeah, that was a really good session. We 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 should have more of those and. Like I said, in, in um, later later today, in, in mine, I, I will be sharing a little bit, uh, kind of tying into what, what, what Jerry was sharing, uh, but more with the ESI Air, so. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, it's cool. I don't have everything totally optimized, yes, but it's uh, it's getting there. It's uh, I'm doing it bit, bit by bit, but it's, uh, it's coming together. Great. Because there's just so many combinations, you know. I mean, there's so many different ways you can you can do things and set things up, right? And and it kind of as you go through, it's like, oh, maybe I do it this way and or that that way. So so you kind of learn as you go along, and and uh, sometimes you have to take some steps back, but uh, but it's really cool. This is it's really nice to have a you know a, a stable, solid system that's open. I, I can tell you that it's uh, it's really good. That's good. It was a good star party last night, too. Um, yeah, it was good. fun. Wow, oh, those really? images of Jupiter last night. Oh, I couldn't from, believe uh, it. Simon? I know. I mean, Simon's your images are great, but you know, <laughs> no, no, no. Jupiter's so big under that good of seeing with the 14 inch was just uh, absolutely. And you could see the focal, you could see the focal length just coming in. I think oh, yeah. four thousand four thousand millimeter native photo focal length or something. Like that. It's it's nice to see an old. C14. You've probably you know, heard about the asteroid impact that led to the extinction the of the dinosaurs. But that's by no means the only impact that Earth has experienced. In fact, scientists have found almost 200 impact craters all over the world. An important question then is how often do these impacts occur? Is the rate steady or has it changed over time? 
If we play back the impacts that have occurred over the last 650 million years, we find that the impact rate seems to speed up at around 290 million years ago. But that might only be because older craters are harder to find. They may have been erased by weathering, vegetation, and geological processes. To test this, scientists have now looked to our nearest neighbor in space, the Moon. The Moon and the Earth are close enough that they should share the same impact history. But the Moon isn't subject to the forces that might erase impact craters on Earth. Using rock abundance data from the Diviner instrument on the Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, scientists were able to catalog and date the large, relatively young lunar craters, the ones that formed in just the last billion years. And when they plot those over time, they see the same speed up at around 290 million years ago. The change in the cratering rate isn't just an artifact of the crater record on Earth, it's real. The Moon is like a time capsule, preserving the geological history of the Earth-Moon system. By studying the Moon, we can learn a great deal about the history of our own planet. Hello everybody, this is Scott Roberts with the Explore Alliance and Explore Scientific and uh, uh, it's, it's Wednesday and uh, it's a very special day, uh, which Kent will be talking about later, um, but um, it is, uh, you know, uh, just a great day overall. Um, we were talking last, uh, about last night's Global Star Party um, and uh, some of the uh, amazing planetary images that we were seeing live last night from Cameron Gillis and also from Simon Tang. It was a lot of fun. Um, and we had this incredible lineup of young astronomers that were on. Uh, I, get, I think the youngest one was um, still Libby in the Stars. I think she's 11 years old. Uh, we had uh, uh, Deepin uh, in Nepal. He was 13. We had some little bit older teenagers that were on, including DT, Deep T. Gautam and uh, uh, others from the Nepal Astronomical Society. So it was, it was, um, it was a great event. If you did not see it live, make sure you watch it in rerun. Uh, it's available here on whatever channel you're watching on right now. So, um, but uh, I want to, um, uh, we've got Annie here from the Explore Alliance and she has some updates for us. Hey, how's everybody doing? Hope, uh, I hope everybody's doing good. It's been a while since I've been on here. Um, I, you know, I wanted to come on and say, you know, I apologize for that. I'm not missing an action. Uh, we are extremely busy with new product, uh, new stuff coming in and uh, filling up the warehouse and just trying to take care of customers. So it's kind of, it's kind of put me on the back burner a little bit. So, but um but uh, still being able to communi communicate with customers and help them out and stuff as much as I can. So that's, that's really good. Um, Explore Alliance is, is trucking along. Um, we have some great things happening. Um, my favorite one, I personally like, um, Scott has, um, has uh, updated our calendar and it looks so amazing. So I want to... <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. So I want to I want to show that to everybody. So let me share my screen here. <clears throat> so it's a little bit more interactive. Um, of course, it's the same way of finding an Explore Alliance, Explore Alliance uh, live and you click that you're going to scroll down and we now have this new wonderful calendar. Um, you can click, um, it goes by date. You can click on whatever it is and it'll pop up, show you the time, what's going on. Um, and so we are going to start morphing our, um, all of this, uh, all the other stuff that's down through September, it looks like, um, September 5th on next there. Next year. Next year. <laughs> Wait, does that say next year? Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> September. I still have some, I have some things I need to add in there, but um, hopefully this will be a little bit more user-friendly, especially with those that are, um, 
that are avid uh, cell phone users. Yes. Um, we we know we noticed the other day that um, this was not very user friendly um, in that format, and so we wanted to move it more to a calendar type setting. You can scroll through and see the dates, and it'll just you know everything's on there, um, and it'll show you the date. So we'll we'll get that all updated for everybody, and it's, it'll be just a little bit. You can click on the date so it's going to be so much more user friendly uh, it's it's pretty amazing so um we've got that um i do want to say september's almost over and it's going to be it's not on there now it was it i when i looked at the calendar earlier scott it was the week of uh women women astronomers i uh... It is still uh, the it's that's in October. That is World Space Week, mm -hmm. and that's October fourth through the tenth. It happens yep. each year. Uh, but the theme this year for World Space Week is women in astronomy and science. Yep. So, yeah, yep. it was it was on there when I when I looked about thirty minutes ago. So I don't know where it, where it's gone. Yeah, it's, it's in it the was new on there. And you have to go to October. <laughs> oh, see, he art look. Back, he's art. Back up, you back you up. are you are all ahead of me. Look at that. Okay, wait, August, August, September, September, September. See, I'm still learning how to there use it. There you go. And see, October. Look, there it is. World there it is. So then you can see that it's all day long and it even has the, has the link to it. So you can click on it and it will take you there. And there it is. So it's very, very interactive um, for our, our uh, users. And so very user friendly um, for that. So, but um but yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much uh, what I have so far to update. I um, really apologize to all the members that I have not been. It's just been it's been really busy. It's been it really been. really busy. It's been, and we have so when you call in to all of our customers and members, when you call in, we have two new two new customer service reps. They are absolutely amazing. One of them's names is, uh, she goes by uh, Jesse, and then the other one's name is Wade. And so we have some great new customer service reps. So you'll be hearing some new voices. And um, and so that'll be that'll be fun. So get to know them. They're, they're here to help us help you out as much as possible and um, be patient with them because they're still learning too. So so we've got we've got a lot of exciting things going on and happening here at here at Explore Scientific. So it's been really good. Really good. Thank you. Thanks, Annie. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, what about the astrophotography? <gasps> yes. Okay. So I, see, I, I told Scott, I said, I've got to get on there and, and announce it. We still have it. Oh, my gosh. I'm telling you, I, I, we have a full audience. Okay, so so we have an astrophotography contest still going on. It was started the 1st of September, I believe. Hang on, let me look and see, because I don't remember. This is, uh, this is me not remembering what's going on. Uh, it's the sol, we're doing solar, solar um, astro, uh, astrophotography right now it's going to run through we're most likely going to extend it because we have not been um promoting it very well i'm just going to be honest um we i've dropped the ball a little bit on it and i apologize for that so it's supposed to end october 1st but i'm going to get with tyler and see if we can extend that a few weeks for everybody so um just uh, you'll send those pictures you'll go on to our website Explore Alliance, you know, and then Explore Alliance uh, Solar Astrophotography Contest and submit those pictures, um, only two per two per uh, person. And um, we'll, yeah, we'll have, okay. we'll have a contest. All right. <laughs> have a contest. Okay. Great. Thank you. I Scott. will put in the link for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, and we have, you'd like to add? We have that new, um, that new entry uh never before seen so if you it we i highly encourage encourage you if you have never ever um entered a contest with us please 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 do so we want to see your work we want to see oh, what new you're entry doing for like first timers mm -hmm. right first time you yes first time entries okay. 
Yep. So somebody that we, you know, somebody that's never, ever entered a contest before is what we're wanting to see. And so our contest. Uh, yep. Yes. Our contest. Yeah. So, yes. Our contest. And so, uh, cause we've had so many, I mean, I think we've had six, right? I think we've had six so far all together. Maybe something like that. So, uh, so also too, uh, if you had entered the contest before, uh, we did publish uh, the latest edition of Skies Up Magazine, and there's a link uh, to get there uh, in this post. Um, but we uh, we published, uh, I think it was like two submissions from each of the uh, submitters, you know, so uh, your work gets published um, and uh, seen all over the world anyways, which is great. And uh, of course, we highlighted winners as well. So uh, but uh, it, the the gallery is really stunning overall when you see all the different entries. Yeah, it's really neat to see all that. And and then we also post every entry um, onto uh, I believe I believe they've started. Do we do them in the customer in the customer page on on the website? Show me. Do you remember? Do you remember? Uh, I don't. Uh, maybe it's only if they use Explore Scientific stuff. Let me get to be. it. That let, could me be. let me share it. Maybe more like a um, yes. know, product capability. Yeah. Um, so if you so if so okay. if you if you use a customer uh, uh, if if you use Explore uh, scientific stuff, uh, telescopes and things like product um, items, then it would it would get pu published on here as well. So. Um, very cool but yeah so yeah so we've got there's a lot of things that you that can happen by uh through that you know and it's just neat to it's just neat to see everybody's abilities and what they're using and how they're using it and um it, it it's a really neat thing so but, but yeah that's about it that's about it okay all right all right well thank you annie and uh we'll uh transition over to kent so Kent, what's the special day today? And you are muted. It's not my birthday. Not your birthday. How about your wedding anniversary? No, that's in no. Um, May. How about my birthday? Uh, I don't remember when your birthday is. Let's see. It's today. I, I, no, know, it's I know what it is. Hmm. I just now realized it. It's the birthday of fall. That's what it is. Ah. About you got it. About two hours and seven minutes ago, fall of 2021 was born. And because also, also, ahead, what else was born, Kent? And the spring ah. of 2021 for our southern compatriots. That's right. And I have commenced because of you know, I just called it the, the fall equinox or the spring equinox, but now that I'm part of a global company, I've been thinking of, of this more globally, and mm -hmm. I'm trying to think of them as the March equinox and October equinox. That's because, a more accurate. Because we don't have to say, in the Northern Hemisphere it's this, and in the Southern Hemisphere it's that. We can just say this, the March equinox, and, and, and we cover both of what's going on. But right. I, and so, on the equator, it's just like another day of much, right? Another, another day of the week that ends in Y, <laughs> right. basically. Um, so, so actually, twins were born today, is what it amounts to, ah. is, and they came out at the same time. They're both exactly the same age. So, you know, it's the equinox represents the gift of seasons. You know, uh, and so if we can make things work, I like that, yeah, the the gift of seasons. Maybe uh, I'm not going to say it because somebody else can steal it, but yeah. That's, yeah, you we, should trademark that. We we should do that. All right. So anyway, you know, uh, this is from NASA. Give credit for Earth Observatory at nasa.gov.com, blah, 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 blah. Uh, a frequently misunderstood concept in science is the reason for Earth seasons. So if people have this sort of idea, and a lot of our astronomy people may have a much better understanding than a lot of people do. Uh, and this joke here is, as we experience this, the September equinox today, Anyone try to balance an egg yet? There's all sorts of people who say you can only balance an egg on the equinox. And, you know, people just go on and believe that and think that's the truth because, you know, Facebook. Um, but I guess they don't try and balance eggs on other days of the year to see if, in fact, 
it can only be on the equinox. And clearly you can balance an egg on other days of the year. If you have the ability to balance an egg, I, I've never tried to balance the egg, but um, I suspect I'm not, I'm pretty ham handed. I probably wouldn't. Uh, so anyway, and a little bit of math here around 6 a.m. local time each day, the sun and the earth and the geosynchronous satellites form a right angle, affording a straight down view of the Terminator, the edge between the shadow of nightfall and the sunlight of dark, dusk and dawn. I never really thought of how the shadow moves over the course of the year. If you take a picture at the same time every day from the same from from of Earth, then you're going to have a shadow that moves because it swings back and forth. So uh, this controls, you know, where the sunrise and sunset is. It controls the length of the day. Uh, so um, around March 20 and September 20, the Terminator is straight north-south line, and the sun is uh, sits directly above the equator. So, on and on around December 21st, um, the sun is over the Tropic of Capricorn, which is uh, the northern hemisphere, and uh, in the June, the sun is over the Tropic of Cancer, spreading more sunlight in the north. I had that backwards and turn the tables on the south, okay? Uh, this causes equal amount of sunshine to be spread over more areas near the top and the bottom of the globe. All right, so a little bit more here. So here's an animation. Well, it was an animation by NASA. There we go. Here's an animation by NASA that um, explains that line. So right now we're looking at... Uh, not one of the equinoxes because remember we said that the shadow line on the equinox is, is a north-south line and we'll see what happens. All right, watch this animation. So it looks like, here we go. It goes pretty quick. So right there. And now see how it's going to start moving back the other way. Right there is going to be one of the equinox. And then it's going to move back to the other equinox. Let's watch that again now. So see how the Terminator line changes position. And this is all caused, thank, thank you, by the tilt of the Earth at 23 and a half degrees, I think is exactly what it is, real close to that. One more time. This was fascinating. I'd never seen this view before when I started getting ready for the, for the show but it's sort of mesmerizing. And uh, we've all seen probably the picture of the analemma, which is the term that describes what the sun looks like. If you take a picture every single day of the year that it's clear, it's say 10 o'clock in the morning, it forms a pattern in the sky that is a uh, figure eight on its side. Um, and if you look on it, most globes, have it, and it's called so-called the equation of time. There's times when the sun runs fast and times of the year when the sun runs slow based on exactly solar time. This is what causes it when seen from space is this back and forth movement of that shadow line. So we also have, um, as we know, the sun isn't moving. It's the orientation and angles between the earth and their star, the sun. About 23.5 degrees, yep, to the sun and the ecliptic plane, the ecliptic plane being the plane of the galaxy. Um, so it's a cool, simple mathematical thing that causes on one specific day of the year that shadow line to be perfectly north and south. So we also have this real cool, I found this on National Geographic. Uh, on YouTube, uh, credit National Geographic and YouTube. Let's watch this. Uh, darn it. I'm going to have to unshare and reshare. Sorry about this. I, as I always do, I forgot to share the sound. There is sound with this one. Here we go. Twice a year, day and night fall into balance, lasting for nearly equal lengths. Known as equinoxes, Latin for equal night, 
They occur in March and September, and along with solstices, mark the changing of seasons as Earth travels around the Sun. Astronomers like to describe the equinox within the conceptual celestial sphere. Here, the heavens are projected around the Earth, like an enormous planetarium. The model is bisected by the celestial equator, a projection of Earth's own equator. The equinox occurs at the point at which the sun's path, or ecliptic, crosses the celestial equator. In spring, it is known as the vernal equinox, and in fall, the autumnal equinox. The other two seasonal points on the sun's path are the two solstices. In the northern hemisphere, the summer solstice marks the longest day of the year, while the winter solstice marks the shortest. The seasonal aligning of the sun has been more than just a unique celestial event for humankind throughout history. Ancient sites like Stonehenge in England and Machu Picchu in Peru have well-documented solar alignments during the solstices. Similarly, the equinoxes have been associated with some amazing man-made phenomena. In the ancient Maya city of Chichen Itza, the great pyramid known as El Castillo is oriented along cardinal axes. During the equinoxes, shadows cast by the railings create the illusion of a writhing serpent body descending the northern steps where it joins the carved serpent's head at the base of the stairway. The cultural significance of the fall equinox and changing of seasons continues today, especially in the northern hemisphere where the autumnal equinox occurs around harvest season. In fact, the full moon nearest the autumnal equinox is commonly referred to as the harvest moon. In China and other Asian countries, this time is celebrated with the mid-autumnal festival. The origins are linked to the birth of the moon goddess, and festival traditions revolve around families with reunions and feasts and special moon cakes. In Jewish culture, thanks for the harvest is given during the week-long Feast of the Tabernacles, or Sukkot families eat meals in temporary shelters outside, recalling the Israelites' days in the wilderness after the exodus from Egypt. And boy, that just stops, uh, stops abruptly, I'll tell you. So um, this sort of stuff just fascinates me. Um, uh, that um, So I, I think I, I was think actually... Really cool. Yeah, do yeah, I, I mean, it, all the different cultures all the different cultures and, and uh, you know, it's, it's really neat. And I have yep. to say, you know, last night we were, uh, Kent, we were talking, the mooncake uh, reference was uh, something really interesting. I, I think a lot of the Western culture doesn't know that, but um, for anyone who's been involved with uh, working with Asian culture, it's it's a big deal and it's uh, it's a oh, wonderful yeah. treat. So, if, <laughs> so when, you, when you go to Costco, uh, Costco has uh, <laughs> these mooncakes uh, on sale couple of months before the autumn festival yeah but they go they sell out like hotcakes so yeah. if you ever if like you ever go cakes. they're their best like price. moon cakes <laughs> yeah those, those cakes. cold cakes and, and no no so I, I highly recommend yeah go go for it and, and try them out uh you know buy a box they're like less than 20 bucks and um it's it's a really nice treat and but they'll be gone uh <laughs> anyhow yeah. Yeah, it's so, hard to stop eating that. you know and and a, a number of our dealers uh, are observant Jewish businesses, and much of the month of September, uh, they're off for religious observances, and this week, they're basically shut down uh, because of uh, the the uh, October equinox and Sukkot for them. So, uh, it's, it's always amazed me how many cultures are um, intertwined with things like the equinox you know you go back to stonehenge there's stonehenge alignments now i am going to reshare my screen because i was sharing my desktop and not my screen there we go all right so so gonna go on a little bit um come on let me get it back in presentation mode all right so anyway so this is a picture, there's an astronomy picture of the day on May 12th, 2001, copyright Anthony Iomatis. Um, this is a picture obviously of a village, I believe it's gonna be in Greece. And it shows uh, the 
the equinox, dead center, and the movement of the sun over time, my guess is if this is in Greece, it's probably looking west uh, to a, a setting sun um, because, uh, no, it would be looking east to the sunrise, I think. Summer solstice would be on the left. Uh, the winter equinox solstice would be on the right. So it shows sort of the movement, how the sun will move back and forth. If you think about that shadow line being at a sharp angle and then being perfectly north-south and then back at it, swinging to another way at a sharp angle and then coming back. And um, here's a picture I took of a, uh, mm. a grave. It's a, it's a burial vault uh, here in uh, Northwest Arkansas. And there's a notch in these two hills, which are really two uh, mountains lined up behind each other, but they create this notch. And I was not lined up perfectly with this because you can see the uh, side of the square obelisk and notice the sun is not lined up square over the, uh, the circle. So um, it's either fortuitous alignment or they did it on purpose. And this is very old. Um, here's a picture showing the shadow line. And if you notice in this V right here, oh. yeah. that, that the shadow line cast is perfect, perfectly aligned with the V notch in this, okay? So the setting sun, the rising sun's coming from the right. And you've got, and this was taken um, in the spring three or four years ago with a couple of members of the Murphys, Scott, Bill, and uh, Murphy, and Jolene, his wife, took me out there. I and see. so it's it's just that a really, really cool. Really cool. I mean, uh, of course, the 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 stone worker that created that thing uh, you know, must have known, but uh, they, how do you set it up? You have to do it on that specific day, I would imagine. And there's lots of different places this could have been placed. And this pretty clearly, I mean, I truly believe this is placed in this exact place to take advantage of that notch in the hillside. Yeah. And it's perfectly aligned north and south so that at the right time, everything lines up. And the point of it is it shows how before, you know, really good modern calendars, how in tune our ancestors were with the rhythm of the seasons the rhythm of day and night were part of their integral life. And, you know, mm. they didn't have electric lights. They didn't have things at night. They didn't have light pollution. So they were really attuned to sunrises and sunsets. And so effectively they created their own little stone hinge, if you will, with the, the marker on their grave. And so here's a picture of it, right? And again, you can see that little notch right there in the ball. And, uh, see how the face the east face is completely lit but the north face is the, the south face in this case is not they knew exactly what they were doing when they did this and lined this up um and it's just out on a on a, a, a rural road uh not a lot of development around it um and it's northeast of, of benton county um uh, northeast of, of bentonville in arkansas but a very cool alignment. Um, it, it was did just. You, did you take that picture last year? I took it about four years ago. Oh, okay. Because I was like, that ah, looks like it's winter time. Three, three years ago, <laughs> I took it in this. This is in the spring. Okay. Okay. Had, uh, hadn't warmed up yet. Yeah. Um, so that's so anyway. neat. That's really neat. That's really cool. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, died in uh, 1885 and 1900. So. Uh, I thought I had, hang on, dead gummit. I had one more picture. Is it dad gummit or is it dad burn it? I say dad gummit. <laughs> I could say dag nabbit. That would be dag another. Nabbit. Yeah. Dag nabbit. Let me, I think I got, let me see. There's another picture I put in. I also say I fiddlesticks. I don't say fiddlesticks. That's too simple minded. How about shucks? You just I'll called me simple. Did you just call me simple minded? Oh, no, I didn't do that. <laughs> so that, that's in a slideshow. That was the last picture. I thought I had another one, but um, it's just very cool how, you know, how that's that probably the most amazing, uh, you know, 
gravesite I've ever seen with uh, that wasn't belonging to like a pharaoh or something. You know, I, so. I suspect there's more out there Ooh, that is not documented. We don't know about them. You know, so anyway, it just shows how in tune to the season our ancestors were. You know, whether whether they were in China or you know in in Northwest Arkansas or anywhere, the rhythms of the day and night and of the seasons are intricately tied to the rhythm of the sun and the moon and the rotation of the celestial sphere. sphere. Always fascinating to me. Um, you know, just amazing. And I'm sort of inspired. I'm working, I'm, I'm building a house and I, I think I'm going to try and build my own little Kent hinge out there somewhere uh on the acreage <laughs> you, you get know. that going i'm 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 heading out that way to see you build it that, I, that'd I think be cool. i'm gonna set a, up one of our action cameras on a time lapse you know yeah, i think i'm building a kent in just some measure yeah mm -hmm. so anyway we'll see how that goes but but i am inspired by by what i've done today to, to go into hadn't thought of that until effectively just now but might line up a little observatory with with a mark you know in a mountain or something to uh Make it all work. I don't know. We'll see what happens. But, you know, uh, silly ideas turn into cool things sometimes. Right. So Did you uh, uh, on um, on Global Star Party, it was either this last time or the time before when Marcello was on and he was talking about I think it was this last time he was talking about how his students are making um, uh, sundials mm. and, uh, you know, pretty simple. I mean, he just has like a student raising his hand into the sky and then where the shadow lands that's where they put down a brick or they put in a mark okay mm -hmm. and they just come out and do it every day or every week or how many days yeah. you know how smooth you want that arc to look okay and uh, uh, it was pretty interesting and so he had several examples and uh, one of them had uh, flowers painted on on the asphalt every, on every spot that they measured so it was, that's cool it so, was cool uh cool. one of the members of sugar creek astronomical society the the, the club i'm the president of uh, is a science teacher here in, in 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 springdale and i suggested to him that a cool pro and he's teaching teaching uh five sections of astronomy this year mm -hmm. and uh they've they've created a new astronomy program and it's become very popular. Um, I suggest that he find a place where a window or something casts a good shadow uh, on a floor somewhere, like in the cafeteria. And it's say 10 o'clock every day, the sun shines, go put a mark on the floor and then effectively create a sundial, a calendar sundial, not a time sundial that will then show the day it is based on where the shadow of the sun lands and it's going to create a, another again it's going to create an analemma of uh, the figure eight if you've ever watched the movie castaway that's how he marked the passage of time on that cave wall was chipping in a a mark of every day where the sun landed so he was intrigued by that however he wasn't sure the administration would go for writing on you know put permanent marks on the cafeteria floor but hey I said, don't ask, just do it. Let them, you know, do it, yeah. I mean, yeah. So he didn't like that idea too much either. So anyway, <laughs> the equinox, the gift of seasons. That's what yeah. it is. Wonderful. Wonderful. Okay. Well, that's great. Um, okay. Uh, so let's, uh, let's go ahead and uh, make a transition um, uh, to uh, uh, camp astronomy, but uh uh, let me just look and see if we have any questions or I think that uh, uh, Annie was answering some questions about certificates. I see that. Um, Harold Locks has asked for forgiveness after the fact. Yes. Yeah, yes. That's how you get things done. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll use that against you, Scott, one of these days. Make you go back and watch this movie. <laughs> That's right. Hey, if you got to get something done, you know. Hey, Scott, you one of your answers was when I lived in Taiwan, my apartment was on a street that had yeah. a bakery, and you yeah. could smell the mooncakes. 
Yeah. Mm. It was good. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That's right. Yeah. All right. So All right. I'm going to bail um, off. I got some stuff to do. Cameron, good to see you. Y'all have right. fun. Uh, I'm going to leave the show on and on, 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 on my screen to watch when we get off of the broadcast. So, okay. Hey, I appreciate everybody. Um, you know, uh, we love doing this. It's great fun. Have a great afternoon. Bye. I love these fly throughs. I oh, me too. last night, me too. last nights with uh, Pekka's, that was fantastic. Oh yeah, Going yeah, I got to find that one. Yeah, yeah that was, was really cool. nice. But all these visualizations that have been done for astronomy is pretty incredible. Oh yeah. Stars are in many ways similar to living creatures. Like humans, they have life cycles. Investigating stars' life cycles in the 1930s, two visionaries, Subramanian Chandrasekhar and Robert Oppenheimer, discover that the most massive stars end their lives very differently from smaller ones. The life cycle of a star really depends on its mass. The mass of a star determines what's going to happen after it finishes burning its hydrogen fuel. All stars start out burning hydrogen, the lightest atom, using hydrogen atoms into helium, working their way up to heavier elements. Gravity wants to crush the entire mass of the star, but the enormous energy released by fusion pushes outward, preventing the star from collapsing. Stars are stable because we have an outward moving pressure due to nuclear fusion, and that's balancing with the inward force of gravity. Smaller stars can't fuse elements heavier than helium. But in the most massive stars, fusion crushes heavier and heavier atoms all the way up to iron. Iron is such a massive element, it has so many protons in it, that by the time you fuse iron, you don't get any energy back out. Iron is a dead end for stars. Fusing atoms larger than iron doesn't release enough energy to support the star. And without enough energy from fusion, keeping the star inflated, there's nothing to fight gravity. And gravity wins. And so the entire star collapses very rapidly. Trillions of tons of material come crashing down, hit the dense core, and bounce back out, blowing off the outer layers of the star in a massive explosion, a supernova. The more mass, the more gravity. So if the remaining core is massive enough, gravity becomes unstoppable. There's no known force to prevent the collapse to an infinitesimally small dot. Gravity crushes the stellar core down smaller and smaller and smaller until all its mass is compressed in an infinitely small point. A black hole. Well, All right. uh, so what did you think of the, uh, that little featurette there? Thanks. Oh, I love it. It's really cool. I mean, uh, and also the, the, the stardust, uh, you know, I actually, uh, this is right down, uh, David Iker's alley, you know, all the minerals, right. Yeah. All the, we're, we're, we are made of stardust. Right. And I love that, that, uh, quote as well. 
Oh yeah. And uh, yeah, the material. No, thanks a lot. This is great. I love those uh, those videos, those clips that you put in, and they're they're good because they're they're nice and uh, efficient. They're succinct, right? Yeah. Uh, they, well, that's what we try to do on our programs: is give some you know, kind of compact. You're, I love it. They really, uh, get, take you to that place. Yeah. Is it? It uh, looks like my computer is a little bit delayed, but uh, you can hear me okay, right? Hello. It's kind of, uh, it is interrupting. It's it like, is interrupting. Okay. Yeah, it sounds sounds like bubbly. Okay. Uh, give right me... now, it's right now. It's fine. Right now, it's okay. Okay. Good. All right. So uh, yeah, let me uh, let me share my screen. So here we are on Camstronomy. So Camstronomy episode eighteen. It's, uh, in presentation mode. So yep, uh, episode eighteen, and we are. Uh, and we've done. Uh, I've added a couple more objects into the best and brightest. Um, some of them I haven't observed because what what I also now that I'm adding imaging into my portfolio, um, some of the named objects that you can't really visually see, um, I've added to what I call best and brightest uh, because those are great uh, astrophotography. And and one of the things that I really you know, I, I'm doing it as and I'm exploring and I'm moving from the observational sky survey into the imaging, following up with the imaging, is I really love to uh, uh, to be able to do it all. I mean, basically expand and do combination of visual and then, of course, uh, the uh, recording with, with the astro imaging gear. And then eventually, of course, there'll be even the top uh, I, I, this is just brainstorming, you know, uh, per constellation, I'll, I'll, I, I will take like much deeper as I get better with my astrophotography skills, I'm going to take like multiple nights or, or many hours worth of data and actually process and make some really nice images of, uh, the best of the best, uh, objects in each constellation. So there's a lot of cool ways I can go as we go on this journey together. Um, but again, this is going to take some time, but right now we are moving from Cygnus into Cepheus. Uh, I think it's pronounced Cepheus, right? Uh, Scott? I think that's right. Yeah, that's how I, I yeah, hear it pronounced. I'll tell you though, yeah. um, uh, once I had the privilege of going to Jordan, uh, to work on an observatory out there and I had an Arabian, um, you know, somebody, uh, who is Arabian. Uh, uh, correctly pronounce many of the Arabian uh, star names to me. Oh, okay, yes, totally yes. different, <laughs> totally different than the way we say them in the United States. So, um, I, I wish yes. I had recorded it. You know, it was really interesting. I really make it a point. I mean, like you know, I, I I'm embarrassed to say some of the way I pronounced when I was you know a kid, uh, just starting out, like. Uh, I, I would call it uh, like Belchagese instead of Beetlejuice, right? <laughs> and 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 there would be like uh, other 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 uh, you know uh, constellations or whatever. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So there's a lot of funny uh, things, but but I do like to kind of correct myself and and do have the pronoun. I like to really make sure I have the correct pronunciation. So as we go through this, um, and and we refine this, I definitely want to make sure. I have the right pronunciations uh, as we go through. So that's that's a really cool. It's the intent, yeah. you know. So if you're most most uh, most of us get what somebody else is trying to say, you know. Yes, it may sound a little yes. strange or funny, but uh, yes. no, it's the intent. So, so we are now uh, in Cepheus. Uh, we're going to actually go through the whole constellation. Um, there are 14 objects, and I've taken 22 images uh, that we'll we'll explore together. Uh, and then just kind of picking up where we left off, this was uh, the Veil Nebula complex, um, yes. and my my, cru my crude, uh, uh, you know, tiling of, of this. Of course, it will improve over time, uh, but at least uh, you know, not bad for my first uh, foray. But yeah, it is, it is beautiful. I just love this. I uh, like it. it. It's just really really nice. And um, yeah, so um, so basically, 
uh, and then I also, after I, we've done the, uh, the exploration, I do want to uh, give you a little bit uh, of an update on my, uh, my PMC-8 um, slash Exos-2 equatorial mount uh, configuration gear setup with the, uh, with the ASI Air Pro. Um, and I do want to show you some of the new things I've learned. There's a lot of different ways you can set it up, but I'm kind of going on a path where I'm trying to make it nice and simple and, and help my workflow. And uh, there's a lot of cool things that I'm learning along the way. So I wanted to share with you all uh, kind of where we're at with that. So uh, let's, uh, let's start diving in. So first of all, let's go to our, here we go. We got our um, exploration. So we have finished up with uh, Cygnus. We're moving to uh, Cepheus. And the first object is this uh, open cluster 6939, right at the corner. If you recall, uh, in an earlier episode, we were right at the boundary with the fireworks galaxy, which just has its nucleus right into the Cygnus. But right beside it is this 6939 open cluster. And it is magnitude 7.8. And uh, it is uh, 5.9 thousand light years away. So it's, uh, you know, it's kind of in the pack. Most of the objects as we're seeing in, in the, in the uh, I guess you could call it the Cygnus uh, arm or that, that direction in our spiral galaxy uh, in the Milky Way is, is around the 5,000 light year uh, range. So let's take a look at the photograph. So let's go back to, so here's, this is with my smartphone back in June. Um, so you'll notice most of the images I took of Cepheus, uh, if we go back to, um, here is uh, I, I set the time to June, to middle of June, uh, around midnight because it's getting dark by then. And uh, you'll notice the reason why I, I did Cepheus uh, at that time is because I had an altazimuth mount. Uh, and, and if you look at Zenith, uh, I can still get Cepheus in a very good looking east. Uh, so that was allowing me to take, um, even though I had an altazimuth mount, uh, most of the motion uh, in the rotation was in one direction, in, in altitude rather than altitude and azimuth. So I was able to take uh, pictures in all of CPS pretty reasonably with minimum star rotation. Um, and But of course, now with an equatorial mount in the future, and for those of you already who have an equatorial mount, uh, you'll be able to take advantage of CPS directly overhead. Uh, right at Zenith, which is not a problem for an equatorial mount. So uh, that's the reason why a lot of these images I took kind of anticipating uh, this, this situation, uh, I, I had to kind of take them earlier. So that's just a little piece of information for everyone. Um, so let's go back to the, so yeah, so you can see, this is a nice rich cluster, uh, 6939. Uh, very, uh, very pleasing and it's paired nicely. If you have a wider field uh, view, you can get both the fireworks galaxy and this cluster in the same field of view, and it makes a really beautiful pairing. Uh, this is a fairly dense cluster, as you can see, and I just love this speckling of uh, you know medium bright stars and fainter stars in the background. This is a really nice cluster. Um, here is my image um, with my, you know you can see this is my one of my first earlier images with my ASI Air Pro, uh, sorry my two nine four uh, coupled, and you can see the big netting and all that. But you can see the same type of structure uh, with the with the nice uh, speckling of stars. And also you can see there's a couple of galaxies in here which don't show up yet because I haven't got my calibration frames and all that. But in the future, this would be a really fun, uh, you know, object to take a longer exposure and then get these galaxies in the same field of view. That would be really cool. Um, so that's, that's a future project when I come back. Um, let's move to the next object. Uh, zoom back in. Speaking of galaxies, uh, there's a galaxy right here, 6952, uh, magnitude 10.9. So it's actually quite bright. Um, this is, a, you know, even though you're looking in the direction of the Milky Way, uh, you you get this. This is at 68 million light years away. So obviously, uh, in the in the tens of light tens of millions light year away. So pretty pretty far. And uh, the, I only got this with my um, 294 earlier. Again, vignetting. But you can see a very nice uh, uh, oval there beside a beside a star, mm -hmm. and you know probably with a better exposure or not, you can start to see some spiral arms. But for now, um, this is my first uh, image of that. 
and visually a very, very easy to, 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 to spot uh, at magnitude 10.9. So this is a good one. Um, moving on. 7023. This is actually a cluster and a nebula. The cluster, magnitude 7.1, and let's take a look at that. The cluster part of it, uh, it doesn't say, but let's actually see if the nebulosity is actually calculated. Let's see here. Uh, information. Ah, 1.4 thousand light years. Yeah, so for some reason, the cluster part of it didn't have a distance, but the nebulosity uh, was able to detect 1.4 thousand. So this is really close, actually, uh, you know, anything in that. So it, compared to the 5,000 light year of the cluster, or, uh, the other cluster, uh, this guy's pretty, pretty close and pretty bright. Um, the nebulosity, very, uh, actually pretty easy to see, uh, the, the fuzziness around the star. Uh, but a beautiful uh, photo photo photographic object, as you can see, this was just a very crude. I was very impressed to be able to um, to be able to even capture this with my very first kind of. You can see this kind of a structure here uh, around, kind of like a keyhole structure um, uh, around around this cluster. And visually, you can see definitely uh, nebulosity around this cluster. It's a really nice combination. And, and a beautiful object to photograph as well, because you can get some structure pretty easily. And again, I'm looking forward to, uh, you know, taking longer exposures, better, getting better signal to noise with an equatorial and, and then uh, be able to really make this uh, a beautiful um, a picture in the future. Um, here's a, you know, speaking of which I took a little bit better uh, picture with stacks. Uh, this is in July and then, you know, uh, even more uh, exposure, but now you can see some lines. At least I got my some of my calibration frames, so you can see some field rotation here from the edges. Uh, but a lot more structure you can see, and uh, especially this reflection right here. It's really uh, really pleasing to be able to pick that out. Uh, so that was the best I could do uh, at back in July. But then I kind of ran out of uh, uh, sky time. <laughs> And uh -huh. continued my survey. Yeah, but you got, and, you got the I'm, overall structure uh, that you can see there. It's, especially you're comparing it to the other image. Yeah, exactly. You you can see my earlier images. Uh, they were. You're right. I mean, they these were like kind of one or two shots. This was. Yeah, this is five thirty second stacks. But then you're right. I, I was able to really get it out here, uh, but at the cost of this line noise. So I just need to have a longer exposures to get rid of this, and uh, and then stack it, and then. But yeah, you're right it's so nice to be able to pick out this, this structure already. And you can see it. This is of course the, uh, <clears throat> the sky safari image. Um, moving on. Then we go to, oh, sometimes there's a little bit of delay. Bear with me. Okay. There's this nebulosity called uh, Sharpless uh, 2129. And, uh, if I take a look at that guy. It's uh, the, a lot of the diffuse nebulosity in sky so far, they just call it magnitude 10, uh, which basically means that it's very diffuse and it's, uh, you know, certain, it doesn't mean it's very bright uh, at all. It's, uh, it's very diffuse, but it's, so anytime you see that, uh, you know, you're not gonna see this, it's difficult to see visually. You can notice though, when you use a wide field eyepiece in a night moonless uh, sky, and if it's dark enough, and in my case, I was looking to the east where I have Bortle six. When I look west, I have Bortle eight, so there's no chance. But when I look east, uh, I'm able to see a little bit of texture on this guy. And it's, a, it's pretty far, it's 9.3 thousand light years away. And my image doesn't really show much. Uh, as mm -hmm. you can see, I just was, you know, trying uh, this is going to need some more exposure, and I and here's here's another one I, or I attempted. It's, this was really diffuse. I mean, really diffuse. Yeah. So this was difficult. Uh, and oops, sorry. Uh, so yeah, this, this is this is as good as I can go. But uh, yeah, I again before calibration frames and uh, but I I got the field of view. This is where it's brightest actually. But uh, but to be continued. I'll have to come back to this. Also, when I have my ED80 on equatorial, uh, I'll be able to take longer, wider field exposures to really eke that out. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. But 
this is what I got so far. I got the field of view, but visually, surprisingly, uh, you you can you can actually see the some texture. Uh, you know, I don't know if you can see it on this picture, but it's probably just noise uh, right now. But you can there's a little bit of uh, density, uh, you know, nebulosity along the edge, but it's it's difficult. So we're going to have to come back to this in the future. Moving along. Elephant trunk. Uh, we've heard this a lot. This is a fun one because uh, there is a, um, a couple of nebula. This is a dark nebula in the middle. That's actually called, uh, if you click on it, it's uh, Vanderberg um, 142 is the actual elephant trunk. Uh, this, this here, uh, they, basically the outer nebulosity is the, is the brighter um, emission nebula that's behind. And that one has a different, uh, it's IC1396. So there's actually two nebula, nebulae uh, that are overlapped that make up kind of the elephant trunk here. And if we look, if we look at the specs, let's take a look. Uh, first of all, the dark nebulosity here. So all the Vandenberg are all dark nebula, just so you, just so you know. And then the, the, this emission nebula is the IC1396. So let's look at 1396 first. And uh, yeah, doesn't have any, it's, it's again, 5.59 bright. So you can see the, the large complex. So you'd need a very large, a wide field. This is the elephant trunk portion right here. Um, and then doesn't show the distance. Let's see if we can get it from the dark nebula. Ah, really close by. Look at that, 294 light years. Hmm. Well, definitely a foreground object. So. So this this elephant trunk is uh, yeah it's really close by that's really neat actually um, and you know it, it has a, this tenth magnitude but of course that doesn't mean anything it's a kind of a dead they call it a bright nebula but I think that's because what happens is if you go uh, if you look at the edges of the image let's go back to object information oh this doesn't have the picture let's go to the background nebula and if you look at the edges of, of the elephant trunk it's actually that's the emission portion it's kind of like the the pillars of creation type of thing uh, where you have that wave front uh, that shock you know which has that edge edge uh, nebulosity being ionized probably because of the uh, the star uh, the solar um, uh, you know, emission um, going out to, to basically excite the uh, nebulosity along the edge. Um, and if we go to the image, so here's my very first image. I was amazed that I could even pick it out. Well, this is a pretty faint it, object, yeah. but I actually got it, you know, not bad. You know, this is back in June and mm -hmm. you can see the out, you can see the outline of that elephant trunk, uh, especially this brighter edge here. And it's a smart this is, image, right? No, these these are my per, first. Uh, anytime it's square, uh, rectangular, okay. that that's with my two nine four. Okay, um, I see. Yeah, that's I with see. my Astro camera. Yeah, and then uh, yeah, no, the, the, I don't. I think with a smartphone that would be really really difficult. Okay. Um, yeah, and <laughs> well, I think yes. Yeah, so and you can see the progression, and then finally uh, I got to this point where where basically I got some very nicely defined edges here. Uh, I just need to have a little more exposure time and uh, to get that signal to noise to get rid of this line noise here. But but the neat part is you can see very clearly these uh, what I call the wave fronts, uh, you know, or this emission edge, uh, which is excited from these stars. And you can see that also this nestled. This is also characteristic of the elephant trunk. Uh, this little uh, small nebulosity around this star mm -hmm. down here. So. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, this is my best image of the elephant trunk so far, but it's a fun object to kind of test your uh, your skills. Uh, and uh, visually, you can see uh, again, uh, you need really good conditions, but, but you can just start to see just a very faint outline here. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to the next object. So, zoom back out. Now we're moving down to the more to the east, 7325 or 7235, sorry. Uh, 7235 is a cluster and let's take a look at its specs. Magnitude 7.7. .7. It's 11,000 light years, 11,000 light years. So it's pretty mm -hmm. far. Um, 
So it's one of the one of the more background, but it's a very pleasing cluster. It's a uh, as you can see, uh, this is again with my two nine four, um, you know, bad big knitting and all that. But you can see the really nice, uh, uh, first of all, kind of the string of stars, and, and then some nice uh, background stars as well. So it's a it's a very enjoyable cluster to look at. Uh, moving on to the next object. Uh, let's see here. Seven three five four, which is a planetary nebula. So we're getting a good uh, good sampling of lots of different uh, deep sky objects. So this guy, eight point nine thousand light years away, magnitude twelve, but because it's a planetary nebula, it's pretty good surface brightness. And and as you can see from this uh, astro image here, it's kind of like a ghost uh, circle, definitely non-stellar. And uh, visually, that's what it looks like too, which is like a lot of times these fainter planetary nebulae, uh, they they tend to have like a central star and then it just looks like a fuzzy star. In this one, the central star is obviously not visible. Um, it's probably like a magnitude 14 or something that we'd have to check. But um, but you can still, you can see a little bit of structure here and visually again, very nicely clear little puff, a uh, little round gray puff, pretty much looks like what you see in this photograph. And there's a couple of little, you know, if I do a little more better image processing uh, in the future, uh, you you know, with better calibration frames, you can see there's some interesting hints of uh, brightening on on both sides. So kind of like maybe like a mini dumbbell um, nebula, but that's something for the future, more exploration to be had. So, and again, that's a big thing about the uh, sky survey, which is really fun because you're, as you go through and you explore these, you want to come back to them and uh, and and do some more deeper uh, enjoyment, right? Uh, you, you'll you'll find new discoveries, and uh, and then you can like some of these objects. I'll I'll be definitely taking some more uh, better uh, astro images, and by then, you know, by next year, let's say, uh, I'll have my equatorial um, mount all totally optimized. Uh, I'll be getting uh, probably a new computer with more processing power. And all kind of stuff, and then uh, and then we'll really have some uh, some fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Next object. Now, I'm going to skip the cave nebula because I added it to best and brightness because it is a good astro imaging. I would visually, I saw some very faint. I don't have it recorded here. I didn't actually take an image, but I'm. This is going to be something that'll probably come later in uh, in the year. I might come back to that. But I just wanted to highlight, we're going to skip the cave nebula. Um, that's going to have to come uh, later because I didn't get a chance to get a picture of it. But we have this IC1470, uh, magnitude 11.5. Oops. And it is, doesn't say the distance, um, but it's very distinct, uh, as you can see with this image here. A bad, bad image, but but uh, visually it's it, it it's it's not going to be red, but it's you'll definitely see this little flare of nebulosity around a star. Now, even though the the image or so the um, uh, the uh, sky atlas or the the um, sky safari view shows this big box and you know obviously quite a bit larger, uh, the reality is what you can actually see. And so far, image is this smaller part. If I have a longer exposure, I might be able to get a larger portion of the, this nebula. But for now, uh, it shows up, and this pretty much is what you'll you'll see, except not in red, of course. Its distance um, is about twelve thousand light years. Twelve. Thanks, uh, thanks, Scott. Cool. Okay, so that's pretty far. Wow. Yeah. Yep. That's getting to the edge. Okay. Next one is uh, seventy-five uh, ten. So now we're we're kind of eking towards the border of uh, getting close to. Uh, this attractive bubble nebula. We're not going to do bubble nebula yet, but that's in Cassiopeia. We're getting to the boundary of Cassiopeia here. So this is one Cassiopeia. So 7510, magnitude 7.9 open cluster. And uh, that's 11,000. Yeah, so 11,000, it's very close to this cluster distance. So this is this particular region uh, of objects uh, in the Milky Way uh, arm is, is around 11,000. Uh, distance, so that's kind of cool. So there's obviously a gap between the dark nebulosity to be able to see those objects. So 7510, and uh, it's a nice tight cluster. 
pretty bright stars, medium bright, I call it. And, uh, and there's some nice uh, groupings underneath. So it's a really cool uh, string of stars. And then you have this. Uh, so I really enjoy that. That's a, that's I like a nice, that. Uh, I like your image more than the reference image on the left. Oh, <laughs> okay. thanks. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, yeah. And, and I'm like I said, Scott, I'm going to get better because depending on which object you're taking an image of, uh, you're going to want it change your exposure, your stacking, all that kind of stuff, because you want to get the colors of the stars as well. So you, you don't want to oversaturate uh, and take too long exposures for open clusters, but you do want to do some stacking and stuff to get nice tight. Uh, so I'm going to figure that out and, and really optimize this. So we're going to have some beautiful images of open clusters as well, because I, I really like visually, I, I really enjoy uh, open clusters as well. Uh, obviously, globular clusters are awesome, but um, yeah, so, and now we go to the next one, speaking of which, a Markarian uh, 50. So Markarian has a, a, his own uh, list of objects. This is right on the hairy edge, just like the, uh, uh, just like the fireworks galaxy, except this is uh, open cluster on the other opposite side. And if we take a look at that guy, almost 7,000 light years away, magnitude 8.5, quite bright and also quite dense, as you can see. Uh, there's nothing showing here in the in this uh, atlas uh, picture, but here very nice string of stars and uh, yeah, so that's a, that's a pleasing object, very condensed object. Ah, okay, let's move along, zoom back out. Now we're going to this large nebulosity complex on the eastern side of Cepheus, center blood two fourteen, or sorry, cedar blood, cedar blood two fourteen. Cedar blood. And if we take, yeah, cedar blood. Uh, so cedar blood 214 or NGC 7822. Again, it shows this magnitude 10, uh, which is anything that's uh, diffuse nebulosity. 370, so it's really close, 317 light years away. Cool. And here's, of course, the uh, sky safari uh, image. And then there's my, <laughs> my image here, uh, which, uh, which you can start to see as you start to take um, uh, low signal to noise nebulous images. I've noticed with my um, with my uh, astro imaging, I have a two nine four um, ASI ZWO two nine four. You'll you'll notice that these bands show up. You need to take longer exposures to really get those out of there. Um, so, but you can still see the structure exactly what you see here around the star, brightening down here. And that's kind of visually, you can start to see these types of this type of thing, but in a gray, very gray faded. And so you have, if you have a good night, you'll be able to visually pick that out. Um, this here is an interesting artifact. Uh, this is at the edge. You'll see this sometimes uh, when there's a star in this particular case, it's this star here. Um, but basically when the star is at the edge, there's a, some sort of weird diffraction um, ring thing that comes out here. And you can even see this optically uh, in, in, in eyepieces as well. And has nothing to do with the quality of the eyepiece or the thing. It's it just, that's what can happen um, with your image train. Uh, so I've noticed that that's something you'll wanna take a quick snapshot and then move that out of the frame. In this case, I just happened to show that, but um, uh, I don't know, Scott, if you have anything to say about these, but but this this is something that is pretty common when when the star is kind of on the edge, right yeah, on the edge, right? It's they are. It's kind of reflecting off of something, uh, either the edge of, um, you know, most likely uh, off of a retaining ring, or uh, it's something. You see how small it is, so it's closer. It's closer to where the sensor is. Okay. So it's it's not it's not far up, you know, closer to where the objective is, but more towards the sensor. Um, I've seen effects yes. like that that are large, and you know that they're further down the tube, okay, or or, or up the tube, is it? You might think of it. Um, yes. But, uh, yes. Yeah. And so uh, one of the things that um, uh, you can do, I, I recommend people do it. Um, when they buy their adapters, adapter rings and stuff like that, go out and get some flat black paint and a paintbrush and go and knock off all those little shiny surfaces. When I used to buy cameras way back in the film days, I would I would look at my um, 
my cameras and uh, just look down the light path. And if I'd see something shiny, I went there and painted it flat black. The contrast kicks up when you do this. So even that little bit of light right there is, is having some effect of contrast over the whole image. Thanks, Scott. That's that's a really good advice. Yeah, so I, I'll, I, I'm going to definitely do stuff like that because again, I kind of just started uh, putting my it's image frame together. Equipment, so, yes, that's yes, that's good tweaking. No, that's cool. Good that's uh, yes, and it's, yeah. It's so that was something tweaking. <laughs> I, I like that. Yeah, that's paint. that's what we're. <laughs> yeah, there's some flat black paint. That's cool. Right. Yep. And then, uh, and then we move to uh, the neighboring uh, nebulosity. Uh, this is actually both of them here. So let's go back to that guy, which is NGC 7822. And this one here, if I take a look, it says it's magnitude eight. Again, uh, just like the magnitude 10, it's a diffuse, very large, um, doesn't show the, the distance, but we already know it's kind of in the same complex at, or, you know, in the, I think if we go back to the other one, oops, sorry. If we go to uh, Cedarblad 214, that guy is, yeah, he's 317. So I would I would say that that's around the same distance. And then uh, if we look at the image, it's a bit fainter and more diffuse, but you could barely see this nebulosity here. And it's not a wide field view. I, I just wanted to kind of capture it and get the visual. Uh, with my ASI air, I'm going to do better, of course, uh, in the future. But the main point is that I actually got some of the texture of the nebulosity, and then in the future, I'll, you know, we'll get a better signal to noise and better imaging, and a wider field to be able to really capture this complex a little bit better. Um, okay, let's go to the next object. We're going to skip over and zip way over here right by the North Star. And there's a galaxy close to Polaris. So the, if you look at uh, Cepheus, it, it's a nice, so this is a nice uh, kind of demarcation. So when we finish Cepheus, we kind of go in all the way to the pole and now we're gonna, we're gonna swing back down. But for now, uh, right here is there this uh, NGC 2300 uh, galaxy. And you can tell by the number 2300, uh, if you know the net NGC numbers, uh, they, they start at zero. And uh, that was a survey that was done. And you'll see NGC 40 and starting here. And then it starts to go, you know, in the thousands, 2000s, 3000s, 4000s, and until you get all the way around to around 7000, almost 8000. Then you kind of know where you are in, in right ascension, basically by the NGC number. So there's, there's, um, uh, I don't uh, know the exact. I have to look at it, Scott. You probably know it, the mm -hmm. answer, but but there's there's the numbering is uh, basically based on right ascension. So we 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 basically moved from the seven thousand, which That's is right. near the end, mm -hmm. and then we whipped around. We went past, and we're going to come back to NGC forty. But basically, now we're at twenty three hundred. So that's uh, what, what's the actual? Is there actually a like? If I have a 1,000 or 2,000, do you know what right ascension it would be? What what um, hour? For which object? Oh, any any object. Like if it's a 3,000 series, or is it just that? No, they did it I, I would not know. And and I'm not okay. so certain that everything is based off of right ascension. It could just be yes. a, a sequential uh, numbering system based off of, you know, most sky surveys do sweep logically across right ascension, but uh, yes. but I don't know that's the case for everyone. I mean, certainly it's not the case for, I don't think it's the case for um, uh, the M objects, for example, you know. Oh yeah, Messier's all over the place. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. 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 Now what yes. would be interesting yes. to learn about would be like the NGC, uh, that might be. Um, <clears throat> so yes. that, that's another, but that might be another yeah. case where they just numbered them as they found them, so. Yeah. But one thing I can tell you is that, uh, yeah, so the, so the, now we're at NGC 2300, and I have noticed in my survey and when I did my observation that, yeah, it moves from west to east uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the numbering. So you kind of know roughly where you're at. So this is 2300, and if we click on that, it's pretty bright, magnitude 11.1, so it makes my uh, best and brightest category. 
a hundred nice, clear, clean, hundred million light years away. So it's pretty far. Good bright object. And here's my image. And you can see uh, there's a nice rich, there's actually a number of other galaxies. And there's one that shows up in my, um, in my photograph here. Um, there's, a, there's the NGC 2300, which is quite uh, distinct here. And, uh, and then if you look to the right, let's take a look at that galaxy. If we zoom in. Yeah, it still makes it. So it's uh, NGC 2276. Let's take a look at that guy as well. See, it's pretty oh. bright as well. It didn't make it best and brightest, but it's, it's uh, and as you can see, it's 130 million light years away. You can see from this image, visually, this one shows up pretty clear. I, I saw, I was able to pick out the other um, NGC 2276 right here, but you can see it's quite a bit more diffuse and fainter. So that's why it didn't make better, best and brightest. But now that I'm doing the image survey as a follow-up, uh, it starts to become interesting because you can see it has a little more structure. It looks like it has some spiral arms, um, but that's part of the fun. Uh, so we got 2300 is the one that you'll be able to pick off pretty quickly. And then this uh, neighboring galaxy uh, is really close to, to these stars. So it's pretty easy to, to find uh, visually, but, but it will be pretty diffuse. And then, uh, and, and I can take a dick. You can see there's a lot of juicy uh, far, further galaxies here. Uh, when I take a better, deeper sky image, uh, there's going to be some of these guys are going to start to show up as well, which will be fun. Uh, part of the answer about um, your uh, comment about uh, uh, catalog, uh, you know, stellar catalogs and, and deep sky catalogs uh, being listed by Right Ascension, uh, yes. you are correct. Um, but let's take NGC1, for example. NGC yes. one uh, at the time that the catalog the NGC was being compiled back in uh, for epoch and, and the epoch was 1860 okay wow um, yes. you know the, uh, NGC one had the lowest right ascension of all the objects in the catalog uh, but that's not true anymore because of procession so you know oh, but originally yes yeah. that's that's the way it was done cool cool. Yeah, that's neat. And also, when you think about it, the way is things are discovered, um, you know, if it's a survey, it would be it makes sense. You you have the same equipment. You can, but as equipment goes on, if if the sur if the survey uh, spans a long, a long period of time, and then you have different equipment, you're going to go back and you're going to find other objects, and then you're going to have to recategorize. So I'm sure there there's always these weird. Uh, you know, especially with star charts, I mean, remember Sky Atlas 2000, there would be some objects that would be mislabeled or, you know, uh, they, they were, there. there's some funny ones, like I think um, even Messier, right? Uh, Messier had a couple of uh, uh, items, uh, M40 or something. There's a couple that are actually stars or something. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, anyhow, so uh, that's cool. So let's uh, let's continue the last object. And as in our survey today is NGC 40. So if I zoom back out, we have to go all the way back and we're back in NGC 40. And this is a great object. It's kind of like in the middle of nowhere, but it's, uh, you know, so a difficult to start star hop to it, you know, but if you look, uh, you know, if, if you have a Telrad and you, you take these two stars from the, the triangle of Cepheus, you can kind of triangulate it and get it right around there. And you'll be able to easily pick this out. This, this is a pretty bright object. You can see it even as, in a small scope. Let's take a look at the specs of NGC 40. It's, uh, yeah, 2.7 thousand light years away. And it's um, nice and bright, uh, magnitude 10.6. And of course, Herschel discovered it. <laughs> This is an earlier Thank image. Again, in That's right. <laughs> it is June, June uh, where you can see pretty good structure. And there's a star off to the side. And you can see some of this, uh, which is I'm pretty happy with with this first image. And then this is a much uh, better. Uh, I got my calibration frames in there uh, in a couple of weeks later in July. Uh, and really happy with this. You can see some inner structure here, some of the nebulosity kind of tendrils sticking out. 
And uh, but you'll see visually, you'll you'll see the central star no problem uh, in any scope actually, because uh, it's a magnitude ten star I think. And uh, and then the uh, this nebulosity, what you'll see that's another thing that's nice even in a smaller scope because this is pretty high contrast. Uh, you'll see this um, that is kind of like this ring uh, with these two pieces. Uh, in a smaller scope, you'll just see the, the, the star and then, of course, this little puff and a little bit. Uh, but as you get bigger scopes, you'll start to see uh, a little more structure, which is kind of fun, the inner painter ring. So that's uh, that's the, um, the sky survey for today. And if we go to, oops, let's go back to sky safari. Uh, there we go. Yep. So basically, if I zoom back out, okay, kind of do a, a check where we are. We finished Cygnus. We did see a few. So we've kind of done, let me just uh, move through the procession here. Yeah, here we go. So we've done the band all the way from Sagittarius, Aquila, Delphinus, um, and up uh, Sagitta, we went through Cygnus and Sepia. So now we're going to come back down and we're going to go through, uh, uh, there's Pegasus. I might cut in and do a little bit of Pegasus, but I'm thinking of actually going through Equus um, and then Aquarius and Capricornus uh, and get those um, uh, through. I still need to take an image of the Helix Nebula. Uh, it just hasn't been uh, favorable for me yet because it's pretty low on the horizon for me. But I've got all these other guys, including the Saturn Nebula, uh, which is coming through. So I'm going to probably do a swath coming back down and then kind of recalibrate and we'll come back. I have lots of stuff in Pegasus that we're going to take a look at, lots of galaxies. Uh, but we're going to, we're moving away from the Milky Way now. Uh, we've pretty much done the whole summer Milky Way. We're going to come back. We're going to move away from that, getting into globular clusters and, and galaxies again. So that's my uh, sky survey for today. And then, uh, uh, Scott, if I can take a quick um, um, break for a second here, and then we're going to switch to uh, my uh, equatorial uh, update on my uh, Exos 2. Give me, give me one minute. Sure, no problem. I, I will. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about. Uh... Uh, Caitlin Aarons, Dr. K uh, Dr. Aarons will be on tonight uh, at uh, 7 p.m. Central uh, for her fifth install of Seven Months of Science. Her um, her special guest is Dr. Michael Malaskas, who is uh, he's an astrobiologist um, and he's studying Titan. He's I guess they're they're mapping the surface of Titan now, and he's involved with that. Um, and uh, so it's going to be very interesting. He's examining evidence uh, for uh, dissolution geology. Uh, those are the uh, the, car the cars that are on Titan um, uh, that uh, uh, you know are fascinating. And um, uh, so I think that uh, you know his study of the astrobiology of uh, ocean worlds, and uh, you know it's certainly known that. Uh, Titans, one of them, uh, is very, very cool stuff. So uh, you'll see that here coming up in, oh, just over an hour. So that's great. I guess that was shorter than a minute. <laughs> Anyhow, um, and what else is coming up? We have on Friday, we have focus on astrophotography. Typically, Ross invites a special astrophotographer to come on board for that. And um, I can see Cameron still kind of getting ready here. I'm ready now. Yeah, sorry. Ready now. Thanks, okay. Scott. Um, Thanks for covering. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so, <laughs> okay, so everyone, now we're going to switch to, um, thank you. Uh, we're going to switch to talking about uh, how I've got the ASIR uh, connected with the uh, Exos 2 and uh, what I have set up. So let me um, switch to switch this now to turn off my virtual screen, virtual background, none. There we go. And then I'll switch cameras here. So. Take this off and then switch it to forward camera. Okay, so 
here's my um let me just pick give you kind of a, a quick uh, rundown on how i have my set up now i've taken i got my exos uh two mount and i have my state i've taken off the mac 102 i was using it yes last night in the global start party um for uh here. and uh, and then basically i got my train here with my with my f63 uh, reducer my uh, extension um tube and then i got uh, the uh, filter drawer and my 294 asi 294 and then I have, uh, I just put one uh, counterweight here. That gives me good, uh, good balance. Uh, I needed two counterweights when I had my, when I went to my Mac 102. Eventually I'm gonna have my ED80 plugged in here. I know that uh, last week, uh, talking about harmonics and stuff like that and, and torque and moments, but I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm gonna, I, I wanna have the convenience of having both of my scopes on, on this mount and being able to do wide field and, uh, High power uh, on the same mount, uh, so so I'm not I'm not too worried about that. But uh, I'm and I'm probably going to be yeah. So I'll I'll figure that out. But for now, just want to show you how I, how I have it set up. So I have uh, the PMCA uh, is wired in. So I got my um, this is my right. It so let me turn around here. Got my right extension cable. Your your uh, everyone. This one doesn't move. Uh, it doesn't move around. So you can you can wire and and coil declination on the off your Scott. Yeah, your you your me? audio was uh, breaking up quite a bit. Oh, gee, is it okay now? Mm. Hello? It's okay right now. Can you hear me now? A little broken up, but yeah. Not hearing you now. <laughs> it's breaking up. Okay, just a minute. I'm going to... Okay, let's stop. Okay, I'm not sharing my stream anymore. I'm only sharing my video. Can you see me? Or your can you audio see, is can you hear me okay? great. Yeah, okay, your audio is great right now. Um, we see kind of a free let, let of the mount here. Okay, just a minute. I'm going to plug in my uh, audio direct. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Not hearing you at all, Cameron. Okay, testing, testing, one, two, three. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Okay. How's that? Oh, much better. Okay, yeah. Basically, my Bluetooth was just acting me up, running out of battery. Sorry, sorry for that. So I just, I'm just plugging direct. Okay, let me start over again. So, yeah, there's my Exos 2. And uh, just to show, so basically the way I wired it in is uh, this is the deck, uh, the right ascension, okay? The right ascension uh, motor doesn't move. So you don't need to, uh, you know, you can coil that up and you don't have any cord wraps. So that, that's, that's, that's one thing everyone should do. And then uh, for your uh, declination, that, that one you're gonna wanna have as loose as possible so that it, it doesn't uh, get uh, quarter up. So I keep that on the outside. So that's that. Then on the uh, PMC8 connection side, I have uh, the uh, the power, the power variable. I actually have that tethered to one of the ports on my ASI air. And that's nice because 
um, as we talked about previously, uh, the each of these ASI airports is two amps, but I think the PMC-8 only draws with all the motors even at max less than an amp, right? Uh, but basically, that's right. So so basically, um, uh, you know, and Jerry has confirmed that. So that's nice. So that means that you you won't have any worries about that. So you just get these cables come with the ASI Air Pro, so you can. You can uh, basically plug that in, and that reduces the uh, the power connections. And then the the power for the ASI Air Pro is I did, I got this twelve volt um, five amp power supply, uh, and that that gives plenty of power. Uh, the thing I want to show compared to last time is um, this I added this extra cable here. This is uh, and I think Jerry was talking about it yesterday. This is an uh, a serial to uh, serial to USB uh, cable that you can get on uh, on Amazon or from uh, from Explorer Scientific. You're going to want to get one of those, um, and you're going to want to get one with an FTDI chipset. Um, and the reason why you want that is two reasons. One is you can upload new firmware, uh, you know, with, with that, no problem, and, and then do all the uh, management and installation to manage your PMC-8. But the other reason is uh, it's going to give you a wired connection to either your computer or in my case, I plugged it into the ESI Air. And basically now you have a hard connection uh, that gives you a nice reliable, instead, you know, you have the Wi-Fi, which is good, but then you also have um, with the new firmware, you can do both the wireless and the wired connection. And what I'm doing and what I wanted to show today is how I got it set up so that I can basically control everything from the ASI Air. So you've got to get this, um, this uh, serial to USB FTDI chipset. It's about 15 bucks, um, 15 to 25 or whatever. And then, and then basically um, uh, you're going to have to download the drivers on your computer uh, and then get it programmed so that it, it operates at um, and I'll talk about this when I go to the screens, but you're going to want to connect it up so that it's programmed to 115.2 uh, baud. Once you got that programmed, you actually program the, uh, the chipset in this COM port. Then you can start to connect it all up. Now, basically, um, then I have my, uh, uh, for the camera control, I have the this uh, USB three going all the way up to my ASI two nine four, so that's just the direct. And you can either mount the ASI Air Pro on your dovetail up there, but in my case, I wanted to put it down here because, as you can see, I'm powering from here. I have a lot of different cables, including an Ethernet port, which I'll talk about next. Uh, and I didn't want to have all those cables moving around, so. Basically, the only cable that goes from the from the ground or from the chair or wherever I put this to the uh, to the moving arm uh, is is this one uh, cable, which is really nice. Now, if you have a cool camera, obviously you're going to have to have a power cable also going to your your camera for cooling. But that minimizes. So there's really only two cables. This uh, this port here, the the the, uh, the declination motor cable and the imaging cable and as long as i keep those long enough and clear then we're all good and 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 now i have um so just continuing on the other thing is the asi air the regular asi air pro uh, doesn't have good wi-fi so i use the ethernet port on it to wire directly to an extra wi-fi hub and then that way Basically, uh, the significance of that is everything's hardwired uh, all the way to here. So that means the ASI Air, both the mount on on the uh, on the to the PMC8, the camera, and also the ASI Air uh, control, all go is is all hard hardwired. And the only thing that's uh, Wi-Fi, it all comes through the same Wi-Fi to this hub. Ah. And then I have a different, and that makes one Wi-Fi connection 
to give me access to everything. And then also if I lose connection on the Wi-Fi or whatever, everything still stay, stays working. And the same thing with the firmware on the PMC8, it, we already know that if you hardwired, uh, like, like what Jerry was saying, the, the new firmware can do uh, Wi-Fi and hardwired uh, simultaneously. So yes. this is my way of basically improving the reliability and also minimizing uh, the number of Wi-Fi uh, to, to control the amount. So let me show you on the software what this means. So that's the hardware. So now, looks like I, oh, I recognize like I that guy. Much. Give me a second. Let's see here. There we go. Okay. Yeah. See. So I, I have to make sure these lights are on because uh, I have a kind of a loose connection here. So that's that's good. Now I'm reconnected. Okay. So now I got a lot of Wi-Fi. So let me go back to the beginning. So on my tablet, what I do. Let me just uh, actually go all the way out. Okay, so on my tablet, what I do is I go and I have to look at my connections. I have a lot of different Wi-Fi. Okay, so I'm gonna let it scan through. So you see the ASI Air Pro, that's gonna have its own Wi-Fi. The PMC8 is gonna have its own Wi-Fi. And then I have my own other Wi-Fi. So uh, I don't have, I can use those and that will give me direct connection to the PMC8 with Explorer Stars. Uh, the ASI Air, I can do that if I want. But I got everything, the, the, the hub that I, I'm tethering the ASI Air Pro, I'm connecting that to what I call Mission Control 2, which is up here. And I'm, I have uh, 5G, because uh, you want to use 5 gigahertz if you can. And the reason why you want to use 5 gigahertz, it gives you, uh, even though it has less coverage, uh, it gives you much more bandwidth. So when you're doing imaging, and stuff for mount control you don't need high speed so you, you you know if you just want but because i'm doing imaging and mount control everything i want to use the 5g connection so i'm going to choose that and it says it's connected and then i just load asi air okay let it load up Let me actually uh, quit out of this so that it shows you the load screen. Let me just uh, close close it entirely. I guess try it again. I guess I've loaded up again, and the first screen it comes up with. Oh, I just started my. Give me a second here. Uh, there. Ah, here we go. Shut down. I'm gonna shut down. And then restart it. Okay. And keep in mind that when you shut it down, you actually are shutting down the PMCA gracefully as well. Because when I did shutdown there, I'm kind of doing things a little bit. I'm just wanted to go from the start. When I do shutdown, it actually dis disengages the power to this extra port. Um, and then it, 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 so when you turn on the ASI Air, Pro, you're actually uh, controlling the power of both the PMC and the ASI Air Pro. So now that's on, I'm going to reload. First of all, I want to make sure again my Wi Fi is proper. So the one I'm connected to, Mission Control 5G, uh, Control 2, that's good. Then I'm going to go to ASI Air Pro. So load that up. Okay, here we go. So this is the first screen you're going to get to. And you'll notice that mount, see, uh, you, you can choose uh, uh, Explorer Scientific. It actually has all the three mounts from the PMC8 in the menu choice. So you choose, in my case, I'm using XS2, but if you have an XS100 or G11, but I'm going to choose this one. And basically, uh, 
And then it has the camera. So you choose the camera. And I'm going to go enter. And I wanted to show you the mouse. If you click on here, here's the telescope. This is where you set it up. So when you program your, your serial port, uh, the, uh, the serial to USB port, and you plug it in, before you plug in, and you have to make sure that you've set it up to 115.2. And there's another thing you have to do for access to. And that's a little more complicated. I'm not going to talk about it right now. But, uh, well, I'm not going to show you the details, but you need to download the FTDI uh, controller menu. And you have to change. Uh, there's a little uh, um, guide where it shows you how to reprogram the uh the the voltage you have to invert the voltage on one of the um uh, pins so that basically it it's, uh, inverts the clock signal somehow and and when you reprogram that then you can plug it into the asi air pro and it mm. will recognize it and it will talk to it properly so that's an important step and and i'll come back to that uh but basically, uh, once you once you program that with that software, you can actually plug it in, and then you can you, it will show connected. And basically, once you've done that, uh, you can actually control tracking, or uh, you know the speed in which you want to go, the guide rates, um, all sorts of uh, information, and then you can synchronize with the mount the latitude and longitude. So everything is now communicated between the ASI Air Pro and the, and the um, uh, PMC-8. And the beauty is, once you've done that, um, I'm going to share my other computer screen to show you what, what I'm talking about. Uh, so let's see here. Um, once you've reprogrammed that uh, serial port, if we go back here, you'll have this little mount menu that comes up. And you can actually control your mount directly from here. So if you if you if I you can change the speed. So let me change the speed to full speed. And then if I move with arrow keys, you can see I'm controlling the mount directly. Yeah. Directly through the ASI Air app, and it actually will 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 control it. Um, with with more, uh, you know, I think I've been drawing the more higher than that. <laughs> you can see 256 times sidereal maximum. I don't know what speed, but 255, 12 or something. It actually drives the motors um, uh, at a different uh, different rates uh, than than what the Explore Stars does, which is interesting. Um, but the main thing is now this is all calibrated, and you can start to do stuff like, for example, polar align. You can use the polar align feature, which I haven't done yet, but I'm going to. And what it does is it will pair the uh, the ASI Air camera, take some images um, of, of the of the um, and do visual plate solve, and help you with polar alignment. Which you know that combined with drift alignment, so I'm I can do I can actually use that. For my polar alignment routine as well, Pair, taking advantage of the uh, the imager and also the mount control. So that's uh, that's the thing. What I want to show now. Let me. Uh, so let me go take a look at um, focus. Let's go focus and let's take some pictures. Okay. So so if I look at the mount, this is this is my backyard. Uh, you can see this is a live picture. I, I made it 0 0.01 seconds. And if I use the mount control, let me go down. You can actually. See, I can actually pan and zoom. Nice. So you can actually control the mount. And this is a rhododendron in my backyard. And uh, it's nice to be able to have everything in one interface. But the point is that I got it working. And the only tricky part, which I'm actually going to switch to, I'm going to take a risk here, uh, is, is, the, um, is the, you have to program, you need the FTDI uh, cable, um, USB to serial, you need, and you need to be able to program that. And let me find the guide, uh, and then I'm going to share my screen. So once you got that, then you, again, you go back to mount, you choose your mount, Exos 2 in this case, Make sure it's 
And then all this stuff, like I just showed you, will just work, which is really nice. So now I'm going to I'm going to uh, go to share my screen. Let me just uh, switch over here. Switch it backwards. Here we go. That's me. And then go to virtual background. Back to here. OK, let me go back. OK, now I'm going to share my screen. And I'll show you what I'm talking about on this serial. There's a little guide. Share my screen. OK. So basically, if we go here, so I downloaded the PMC. And then there's this, uh, this must be it. Yeah. Oh, did I lose connection? Uh, it seems like you did. Yeah. OK, let me uh, say this is connecting. Oh, you know what I'm going to do? I know what it is. Okay. I have Wi-Fi interference. Sorry, I have Wi-Fi interference. That's what's causing all these problems. There we go. Yeah, uh, what happens is when I, it, it, yeah, it's reconnected here. Let me share my screen again. Okay, can you see my screen now? Let's see. Yes. Okay, great, excellent. Okay, so yeah, yeah, just a, another tip, tip. But while I'm doing this all in my little office here, uh, when, I, when I turn on the emission control to, uh, with ASI Air, you have many Wi-Fi networks, right? You have the PMC-8 one. It's not active, but it's still on. You have the uh, ASI Air, even though it's not very good coverage, it's still on. Um, and then I have my other Wi-Fi, which is much more powerful, but it still causes interference. And here's the challenge. When I was showing you that live image of, the, um, of my rhododendron in the backyard, uh, I was doing 0 0.01 second exposures, and it was just going like crazy, right? So that creates a lot of Wi-Fi interference. So that was actually what was interrupting the Zoom stream. So that's that's what I found out, Scott. So that's why I was having some problems earlier mm -hmm. um, with my audio as well. But you can hear me okay now, right? Yes, sounds okay, very good. good. Okay, good. So this is the this is a great guide. This is on, uh, I, and I sent the link uh, before Scott last Friday. But uh, basically, uh, this is the link, a uh, part of um, the uh, Open Go To forum on the. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, Groups.io webpage. Yeah, I'll give a link to that here. Yeah, give the link to that. And then there's a nice, awesome PDF uh, guide. Uh, it's called the uh, Exus 100, Exus 2, G11, PMC 8, and ASAR Getting Started Guide. And this is awesome. I mean, actually, if I go back to, I think I might have it here. This, is, this might be it. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is the online. So if I go back, yeah, here. I'm going to send you this link again, Scott, so you can, I'll put it in the chat. So you can, okay. you can include, include it. Give me a second here. Uh, so there's the link for groups.io. And then I'll send you another link. Okay. Uh, oh, here we go. I'm going to go chat. There we go, chat. Copy that. Okay, this this one here. This will take you to this one. And Marco Pola created this PDF, and you can just click on this. And this is what you want because when you get that, you're going to get this this PDF that I'm showing you here, and it will tell you to do exactly what I'm doing to be able to reprogram that FTDI cable so that you can actually. Um, communicate with your ASI Air Pro, plug it directly in. Um, and so if you if I zoom in here, then you basically download this um, this uh, driver. It, you'll choose the COM port. It may, in my case, it was COM3, but it might be a different COM port based on your FTDI. Uh, when you plug in the USB port into your computer, into your laptop, it's going to, it's going to, you're going to download the FTDI driver that way you can program the cable and then you basically choose that COM port and then you program it to, the, to, the, to all the things and you follow these instructions. And the important thing that I wanna to highlight to you is uh, this is Exos, yeah, Exos 2, here we go. It's different between the Exos 100 
and the XS2. The XS100 is easier. It's it's our, you just set it to 115.2 and you're good to go. But in in the XS2 and G11, you need to change uh, some some parameters. Uh, see this invert DTR. You, you when you go into this uh, programming uh, tool, and you just check that that will invert, and then it will reflash the, the the memory on the USB cable on the 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 the, the serial port cable on the FTDI chipset. Once you've got that and you've confirmed it and it, it takes it, then you just plug it in and you do and you do exactly what I showed you. You plug it into the ASI Air and then you're good to go. And these are just some examples. So I just wanted to give everyone kind of the cheat sheet version. Buy one of these cables, make sure it's FTDI, download the drivers, make sure you got the COM port, set it to 115, uh, two, and then you basically uh, um, download this, uh, change the, if you have an Exos 2 or a G11, you're gonna wanna invert this uh, DTR. Once you've done that, then you plug it into the ASI Air. Uh, it's not gonna break it if you, if you don't do it, but it just won't communicate. But once you do this little extra step, bang, it just plug and play, it works. And then you saw I was able to control the, uh, uh, the, the Exos 2 through the ASI Air. Pro, uh, which is really nice. Again, one connection, and then I. So the next step, and you know, to be continued. So that's that's all I have for today. But the next step uh, is I want to get Ascom, and then basically get everything working, and then have Sky Safari control everything. So then I basically have my SAR Pro app, and then I have my Sky Safari, and then I can control and do all my go to and my my. Um, my image run planning all through through that interface. So that's that's kind of the net where I'm going. So it's taking me some time. There's some cloudy nights here. I had a clear night last night, but it's cloudy again here in Seattle. So uh, I'm going to have some more time to uh, play with that. But once I get that, I can do that without having a starry night. Uh, so you know, basically trying to get that set up. So I, it might take me a week or two, but uh, that's going to be the next step. And once I got that working. Oh, then I'll be able to do my my workflow completely with the with my uh, with my new imaging gear setup. So that's kind of where things are at. And uh, yeah, thanks, Scott. I think that's all right, basically Cameron. all I have for now. <laughs> okay. All right. So uh, yeah, we're going to take uh, roughly an hour break, and we'll be back with uh, Caitlin Aaron's in seven months of science. Um, for the fifth install, um, I think you'll find it uh, quite fascinating. Uh, with a uh, astrobiologist and planetary scientist studying uh, the surface of Titan. So um, uh, until that time, uh, hope you can have a nice dinner or uh, a nice short break, and uh, we'll see you in a, in a few minutes. Thanks, Cameron. Thanks, Scott. Thank you.